Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for uh, joining us here this afternoon for uh, the next in the Admiral Markets Trading Spotlight webinar series. Uh, my name is Paul Wallace and today what we're going to be talking about is a, an introduction to how can traders use the commitment traders reports in their own trading. Appreciate that that might be a uh, uh, you know a very new topic for some of the uh, sort of uh, uh, new traders we have here today, but also uh, sort of an interesting topic for some of the more intermediate and experienced traders that we have joining us here today. Uh, what we'll do is we'll talk about it here in the slides, and then at the end maybe take a look at the actual uh, the latest COP report and the uh, how that impacts upon the uh, the sort of chart. So stay with us till the very end. If you're uh, as always, if you're watching this. Uh, here today with us, you're enjoying the session, then uh, please uh, sort of uh, ask questions, interact with us, we'll uh, happily engage you, or if you're watching this uh, later on uh, demand on the uh, Admiral Markets YouTube channel or uh, Admiral Markets Facebook page, then uh, please uh, sort of uh, drop us a comment, drop us a, uh, uh, drop us a note, We're always, uh, we always enjoy the interaction with our clients. So, what am I going to talk about today? Not unsurprisingly, I'm going to talk about well, what is the actual COP report, okay? What is the Commitment Commitment of Traders report? We'll touch a little bit upon how it, uh, it's created, what uh, goes into sort of uh, it being developed, uh, and also about how does it influence markets? How does it influence decision makers uh, who are uh, managing positions within, uh, um, within you know, sort of the wide range of uh, commodities markets? Uh, which instruments are uh, effective, which ones you can see, which hopefully by the end of this you'll, uh, you'll be able to understand. But of course, most importantly, well, you know, how can you use it in your own trading? What is it that uh, can help us with our uh, own trading decisions to, to deal with uh, uh, the data that comes out of the COP report? So for those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, Paul Wallace. I've, I've been trading for a good few years now and have uh, traded for uh, institutions and for our uh, clients. Uh, and primarily my own sort of expertise and uh, sort of interest is in trading FX indices and commodities markets. Uh, and for uh, sort of my longer term swing and position trades, I'm a trend trader and a mean reversion trader for intraday, which is uh, something will become a bit more uh, uh, apparent to you over the uh, series of the uh, webinars as we talk about uh, uh, sort of various versions of swing trading and intraday trading. Uh, and as also we're here with the Admiral Markets, Admiral Markets are Forex and CFD broke with over 8,000 financial instruments with uh, offices in 20 plus countries, okay, all across the world where they are also uh, uh, suitably uh, licensed, regulated and authorized across a wide range of uh, regulatory environments provide very competitive spreads on popular trading instruments like the euro dollar on the DAX uh, and are able to engage with markets through the uh, world's most popular trading platforms, MT4 and MT5, which are available on sort of phone, desktop and browser uh, edition, and also with the uh, Supreme Admiral Market Supreme Edition plugin. If you've got any questions about that, then please be uh, get in touch with your account representative and they'll be happy to help you. So, ladies and gentlemen, as as always, I appreciate we always have a, a broad range of experience in our in our room today. Some completely new traders, others who've you know had some uh, good few years of trading experience. So, today we're going to talk a little bit about an introduction about how to use the commitment of traders report in your own trading. Uh, it would help us uh, a great deal if uh, if you know if you could just quickly uh, ping there in the question box if I was to ask you know how how many people here joining us today would know. The, uh, what the COP report is and, and how many people would actually know how to use the COP report, how to actually decipher it. That always helps us in sort of in terms of being able to give you the most, uh, the most sort of uh, uh, useful and beneficial insight that we can with our time here. But as uh, you know, as you do that, and as uh, we look forward to just uh, interact and ping, we'll ping away with us. What we're always talking about is, you know, what would it be or how useful would it be to us if we could get an idea of, of where the big dogs, the big traders are uh, doing the majority of their business in the financial markets. Just think about that. And, you know, what happened if we could get an idea of how the major players are positioning themselves in financial markets? You know, what if we could see where there are divergences between how the major players see the future direction of an instrument? So if you think about that, you know, if you think about that for, uh, um, you know, for traders, you know, and you think about would that information be useful? Well, of course, you know, most traders would realize that that, yes, that could be uh, enormously useful, enormously helpful. And 
thankfully we can uh, get access to some of that information and we get that through the uh, what's called the commitment of traders reports So, you know, what is it? What is the COT report? Well, you know, you'll hear it termed in lots of different terms, but, you know, it's kind of like the big boy macro news, okay? And it's, it's issued by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission across in the United States. And what happens is that report is released weekly. Every Friday afternoon it gets released, uh, or Friday afternoon if, it's the, uh, if you're trading on a European uh, uh, trading session. Uh, and then it's calculated from the positions that are reported on the end of the trading day on Tuesday. So the data comes out on a Friday afternoon and it's based on the positions that are reported on the Tuesday afternoon. And it shows open interest for markets, which is broken down into sort of three trader positions. Uh, and we're interested in the sort of short format of the uh, of the uh, of the report. And I'll We'll show there. We you know hopefully we'll be able to just ping into that in a moment. Just uh, bear with us. But what it does is that you know if you are a yeah, a, a trader or a certain institution or an individual trader who is uh, has certain position sizes which are they're a, they're a little bit different. But you know if you are trading of a certain size, then there are reporting requirements. So literally at the end of every Tuesday, you know you have to report your positions into the CFTC, and from that data they're able to sort of collate the commitment of traders report which is then announced to the well announced to the open market on the, on the friday and so it's uh, it's you know it's not a uh, uh, what's the word is it? you know it's not a voluntary thing it's a, simply a case that if you're trading at a certain position size then you are to report that position and that provides an element of transparency you know as to what the sort of you know the uh, the big traders are doing and that allows us you know as uh, sort of you know let's say private traders to get an insight into how they are positioned and that can become quite useful information but as i said we're interested into the uh, the short format here what i'm going to do is uh, what you'll find here during the session is that i appreciate you could read into an awful lot into the cot report i appreciate you know we uh, for new traders it might be something that you wish to to understand more and You'll see a few slides down there. We have a slide with quite a few links where, which gives you plenty of uh, plenty of further reading opportunities to really truly dig into and understand. But today we're just going to uh, sort of focus on an introduction to the COT report and how we can use it in our own particular trading. If I just basically just hopefully, <clears throat> we're trying to do a, a live demonstration. Hopefully we can maybe see that. Uh, We'll sort of switch across to that, or that'll bring that up there in a moment once that happens, so we can, so we can have a particular look at that. Okay, and uh, hopefully you can just see it's the uh, U.S. Commodities Futures Trading Commission <clears throat> website, and what it is is particularly we're actually going down here for for the purposes of today's session. What we're really kind of interested in is some of the uh, what they would call the legacy reports, uh, and in particular, what we're looking for is the short format of the. Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which we're just going to look at in a moment. But it's just a case of just being able to, I wanted to be able to show you that. I appreciate you could be, uh, it could be quite confusing. There's quite a lot of data on there. I just want to show you how you can find it and actually help you in, uh, in being able to sort of uh, uh, identify that. Hopefully you can now walk back to see my uh, slides there, okay? I'm hoping that uh, you can all see there. That's what, uh, that's what we're back at there. But as I said, we're interested in the short format and uh, that's what we've just brought up there. And the, the, the link is there. You can find that the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, and as I said, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the short format, okay? That's what we're particularly interested in on the future side for this particular session. You can, there's an awful lot more details you can go into. There's an awful lot of, of fantastic data on the entire website, but for today's session, we're just looking at the short format of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Commitment of Traders report. What we find is that in the sort of short format of the uh, COT report, the report is basically broken down into sort of, let's say, sort of three traders, okay? Three uh, trading groups. We have commercial, so commercial traders who are registered with the CFTC, showing a related business for which futures are used as a hedge. So when we talk about commercial, you know, we're actually talking about, you know, think might be things like uh, for, you know, in terms of commodities, they may actually be the mining companies. Okay, these would be, or maybe it'd be companies that, you know, are, uh, so let's like, say, you know, a big company like uh, BP Shell or Ford, okay, these are commercial operations, okay, 
who are using futures as a hedge for their international business or to, uh, to mitigate their particular risk. You also then have the non-commercials, right? And the non-commercials as a general rule of thumb are comprised of the large speculators, namely commodities funds, maybe other sort of trading institutions or banks, etc. But they are the large speculators. Non-commercial is the large speculators. And the other last final group, which is sometimes called non-reportable or sometimes small speculators, that's made up of small commercial hedges and small speculators, okay? Small speculators were trading at you know small particular position size. That's that wouldn't be that wouldn't be sort of um, traders trading sort of CFD. That would still be traders trading futures through the uh, uh, sort of a Chicago Mercantile Exchange through the CME. But uh, of course, they are still of a certain size, but they are uh, not um, not either a commercial or a non-commercial. Not uh, not the sort of those uh, you know those kind of big dogs that are operating there. So. I said, we can, you can go down into an actually even further deeper breakdown of that. But for today, today, just as an introduction, we just want to understand who's there and what are they actually sharing with us. So, you know, when you actually see the uh, the COT report, this this is what it looks like. It's just, you know, a simple bit of a short format of uh, data. This is from, this is actually for the British Pound Stern. Let's use our uh, wonderful drawing tools here to be able to... Here we go. Let's draw the tools here. Super. Okay, just one second. So yeah, so this is, you know, this was the COT report for the British pound sterling, GBP, futures only positions. This was actually sort of uh, April 2016. This was just in the run-up to the uh, Brexit debate or the Brexit referendum vote in the United Kingdom. And we can see here we have the, you know, the non-commercials, okay? Remember I was saying that they're the kind of large speculators, the large speculators. Uh, and actually, you know, what it says is it tells the data that each one of the contract, a contract, okay, a full contract in British pound, okay, is 62,500 pounds sterling. And what we can see here is, you know, for the non-commercials, we have the numbers for uh, the longs, okay? So there were 38,926 contracts long in uh, GBP, as opposed to 78,954 non-commercial short contracts, okay? So we can see that there was almost twice as many short contracts as there were long contracts. On the commercial side, okay, on the commercial side, we can see that there was 193,799 commercial uh, contracts long and 133,000 contracts short. So just remember that with the commercials, okay, the commercials, they are there, they're going about their business, okay, they're doing their normal business and the futures there are just as a hedge to help them mitigate risk. So the, the upside for that is that they are, you know, they understand their uh, industry. They'll understand the um, particular commodity. If you're looking at that, they'll understand it far better than anybody else. The downside is, of course, remember, they are just trying to offset their risk. They're trying to hedge their risk. OK, and that starts to give us little elements of hints about how we can utilize this data to help us with our own trading. And then, as you can see, the other, the non-reportable positions, the small speculators, we can see once again, they were mostly short there, okay? You know, 34,773 short contracts, as opposed to 14,295 contracts long. So it's just a little bit of a data there, you know, as I said, we're just going to keep it sort of, uh, keep it sort of relatively just uh, a sort of, you know, just an introduction today, because there's uh, it's, a, it's a hugely deep and fascinating subject, which, you know, can provide huge amounts of uh, uh, huge amounts of data huge amounts of uh, opportunity for traders but today you know here we here at uh, as part of the trading spotlight team at Admiral Markets we want to be able to give you an introduction so that it uh, it seems less intimidating i appreciate that for completely new traders looking at the cot report looking at the data could be you know perhaps a little bit intimidating perhaps a little bit overwhelming this is just about being able to sort of provide you with an introduction to sort of help you uh, identify what uh, what it goes, how, we, how it's created, and actually how we can utilize it in our own particular trade. So 
What is the uh, most important bit of data for us when we're looking at? Well, what we want to see is to see the actual positions of the categories of traders, especially the sort of the net position change. So to look at this, you can calculate the uh, sort of subtract the short contracts from the long contracts, whereby a positive result indicates net long position, more longs than shorts, whilst the negative result indicates a net short position, more shorts than longs. Don't really worry too much about that at the moment. This is just uh, information you'll be able to take on board, you'll be able to look at. But you know, what we want to do is to be able to sort of give you a, uh, an introduction to how we can utilize it with our, uh, with our own particular trading. But you know, when you're looking at that, people start to get interested okay, in the net position change because what that can do is that can give us an indication of where market may be at extremes. And that's where we start to, another way of start to get interested in how we can utilize the COT report. When we see that they, uh, the sort of, you know, the commercials and the, uh, the sort of non-commercials, when their positions are at extremes, that is, gives us an opportunity when we see that, you know, they're at extremes, then we start to see a net position change. Well, that might give us a, a sort of a first early warning sign that, uh, yeah, that a market may be about to reverse. <clears throat> so, as I said there, you know, what well, many people said, the most important thing is the actual change in net positions of the commercial hedges. Why would that be? It's because the commercials are generally believed to have the best fundamental supply and demand information. So if you were looking at cot report data for, let's say, for some commodities like silver or gold, or maybe, you know, some of the agricultural, the soft agricultural commodities, if that was what you were looking to trade, well, as I said, the commercials tend to have the best supply and demand information. They tend to be much more sort of closely allied with the uh, what's actually going on within that market. Whereas the net speculators, or sorry, the non-commercials are, they're speculators, okay? They're looking at it for profit rather than actually as part of their business. And this starts to give us an indication of some divergence between the, uh, the two major parties. And we look at how we can utilize that information to help ourselves. So, as I said there, you know, the interesting thing we need to take aboard is that the commercials are not in the market for profit. They are hedging positions. They are transferring their risk to their suppliers. That's what they're looking to achieve. Non-commercials, the major speculators, are not as good as you would have believed, which might be a little bit of a surprise. Remember, the commercials have the best access to information. The non-commercials do not, and they're speculators, and sometimes, sometimes they get it wrong, okay? Sometimes they can be, uh, they get it wrong. Not all the time, but sometimes they can get it wrong. And a little tip for you to start to have a look at is perhaps you look at using the non-commercials as a contrarian indicator, which we'll uh, look at in a moment. We'll look at it in a bit more detail in a moment. But as I said, remember the commercials are not in the market for profit. That's what we want to take on board, whereas the speculators are, which means you know that actually sometimes they can be, uh, sometimes they can be very wrong. So, as I said, you know, there's uh, lots you can read about the commitment of traders reports here. And I put together a few, uh, a selection of, uh, a slide with a selection of sort of uh, links there that you can go and take a look at across all broad sort of uh, um, broader areas in terms of uh, depth of insight you'd like to go into the, uh, the CFTC and also the COT report. There's plenty there to read and it is a fascinating sort of uh, subject to take uh, a look at. For those of us who are taking longer term tradings, okay, sort of, you know, swing longer term trades, well then understanding the cot actually becomes very, very useful for us. It doesn't tend to sort of impact too much on intraday traders, okay, because, you know, the intraday trading has its, uh, has its own pace and rhythm. But if you're going to be trading longer term swing positions, then having an uh, understanding of the cot report is, can be enormously helpful. So let's have a little look at a, a couple of examples about how, you know, how we could possibly use the cot in our trading. I'm just going to use it from some of my, uh, some of my own um, work that I uh, have done with my own trading. Okay. So here's an example from, here's an example from last year. Okay. And trying to uh, understand here, we can see, let's get the old, let's get the old drawing tool out. We can see here, this is the, uh, the cot report here. Okay. That's come out. And in this particular case, okay, this is the Japanese yen. That's what we're looking at here. Okay. Japanese yen, all right, and uh, what we can see, 
excuse me, what we can see is that invariably we have, you know, lots of, uh, lots of change, okay, in the non-commercials, okay, that's the way they're, uh, that's the way they're <coughs> operating. We can see the commercials here, they are predominantly long because remember they're trying to offset, they're trying to hedge their, uh, their risk uh, and they still have, you know, but they still have, you know, more uh, long contracts than short contracts. Same with the, the non-commercials, what we can actually see here, okay, from the non-commercials is that we have about 44,000 contracts of uh, long as opposed to 123,000 of non-commercial <laughs> short contracts. And that's, uh, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty sort of, you know, indicative there. There's kind of, you know, we can see that there's a, uh, there's a real interesting, fascinating point there that, you know, there's, the non-commercials are massively short. And the kind of interesting thing about that is because at the same time as doing that, what you can see here is my clip from the from uh, the uh, my own spreadsheet where what I do every week is to start to look at understanding where the strength and the weakness is within the sort of financial markets, especially within the FX markets, because I'm always as a longer term trader, I'm looking to buy strength and sell weakness. That's where I'm actually looking to do. So I'm kind of starting to be uh, interested that the... Uh, that you know we have the uh, uh, we have the non-commercials very very short okay they are very very short in the uh, in the yen but by my own sort of my own strength and weakness okay what I have here is the Japanese yen is showing me that at the time that was the second out of eight of the major FX currencies so it was very strong okay it was second okay second out of eight whereas we can see that you know sterling was at that time number one. Japanese yen was number two and had been strong for about the last sort of four or five weeks. So, you know, there's a, an indication that, you know, the non-commercials are short, heavily short, but actually, you know, my own analysis, you know, my strength weaknesses analysis is telling me that actually the Japanese yen is actually quite strong. So I, there's a bit of divergence there between the net commercials all being short and my sort of strength weakness work being long. So that kind of uh, starts to raise my uh, interest here, starts to get a little bit uh, sort of taking some interest in what's going on there, looking at that particular divergence. If at the same time, if at the same time, what we also had a look at the Canadian dollar, all right, the Canadian dollar for the same period. The Canadian dollar for the same period has, if we look at the non-commercials, the non-commercials are predominantly long the Canadian dollar, nearly just under 60,000 contracts long as opposed to 40,000, around approximately 40,000 contracts short. So the non-commercials are long the Canadian dollar and they are short the Japanese yen. But once again, you know, if looking at that same time, looking at my strength weakness analysis, well, hopefully you can see that the Canadian dollar at that time, the Canadian dollar was eight out of eight and had been pretty weak for the last four or five weeks. So it was bottom of the pile. It was eight out of eight, okay, the bottom of the pile. So once again, on one hand, my strength weakness analysis is differing from what the actual sort of uh, COT report is telling me in terms of the non-commercials. But remember what I was saying, okay, is that, you know, one thing you can do is when you see sort of extreme numbers is to sort of use the non-commercials as a bit of a contrarian indicator. So if the non-commercials are, if the non-commercials are short, the, uh, the short the Japanese yen, but long the Canadian dollar, well, then we'd have a look at, well, what is the opposite of that? What is the kind of, uh, what is the opposite of that? What's the, how could we use that as a contrarian indicator? And interestingly, you know, here is the daily chart, okay? The daily chart of the, the CAD yen at that particular time. We have here just the drawing tool. This is the, you know, the, the, the sort of CAD against the Japanese yen. So, you know, with uh, effectively, you know, we can see that was actually a very, very nice trend. There's a very nice downtrend there in the CAD yen on the daily chart, which once I said, it was kind of interesting that, you know, the non-commercials were uh, long the Canadian dollar and they were short the Japanese yen. But actually, the sort of the price was going in exactly the opposite direction. So there's an interesting thing, as I said, is that you know sometimes the non-commercials, when they're at extreme numbers, we can see that they can be used as very useful contrarian indicators because they uh, they are you know very good, they're very adept, but they're not always as good as they'd like you to think they are. 
And uh, it's actually, you know, using them as a contrarian indicator can be a way to use the COT report to help you sort of make trading decisions for those of us who like to sort of trade longer term uh, swing and uh, end of day or even sort of, you know, monthly positions. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an example of one way that, you know, using the non-commercials as a contrarian indicator. Uh, and with just some other standard sort of technical analysis, recognizing, you know, that, uh, you know, you can see yourself, there was a nice trend there, okay, and how, how to utilize those divergences to be able to start to build a trading plan of our own. So, um, you know, another sort of a, a example here is a kind of, this is the, uh, the euro, okay, at that particular time. Let's just uh, draw on here, okay. You know, at that particular time, we saw that the, uh, uh, the non-commercials, the non-commercials were long to the long to the euro to the tune of 200 and just under 240,000 contracts as opposed to short 93,000 contracts interestingly the commercials you can see there yourself the commercials okay they're effectively short nearly sort of nearly 400,000 contracts of uh, of the euro okay as opposed to a long 220 but remember that's what we were saying is a case of just recognizing commercials are not there to make a profit, okay? They're there to basically mitigate risk uh, in, their, uh, in their particular uh, areas. So we kind of had the, <coughs> excuse me, you know, we had the non-commercials were, uh, the non-commercials were, uh, were very long, okay? The, uh, the, the euro, uh, the commercials were quite short, but actually what we can see is that invariably, you know, the, the euro was starting to weaken, okay? Having been, having been number one, okay, earlier on in the year, it was actually sort of starting to, to weaken away. The euro was actually starting to, to weaken. So even though the non-commercials are long, we were actually starting to see the, uh, the the euro weaken considerably across the sort of uh, across the um, uh, the strength strength uh, um, strength matrix for the FX markets. And here we are. This is a chart of the euro dollar against that uh, against the, the, the same particular time. And what I'd actually seen was that, you know, yes, the euro had been in a strong uptrend against the dollar. But what happened is we hit the 125 area and we had, you know, a sort of a triple top here. OK, we had a triple top here, which ended with a bearish engulfing candle as a key reversal candle. And so, you know, it was kind of interesting that, you know, what we started to get after that was that actually price started to make kind of, you know, lower highs. So the, uh, the cut report, the non-commercials are you know, massively long, you know, massively long to the tune of 240,000 to the tune of 240,000 contracts nearly. But actually the, the charts and the strength, uh, strength matrix is kind of sort of just giving us a hint that we'll actually, you know, no, I think the chances are that that uptrend is over and we're actually now looking to sort of reverse. And in fact, we're actually probably going to see a sort of decline in the euro along with some strength in the US dollar. Uh, actually, that is what occurred. That's what occurred for our uh, trade. So this is that same area here that we spoke about. But then actually what we can see there is that invariably the price just collapsed quite considerably. That was, that was what we sort of uh, saw there as, okay, as price drifted down from like 125 down to about 115. So over about the next six weeks, it put in around about a thousand pip decline on the, uh, the euro dollar. So once again, it's just a case of, you know, seeing the, uh, um, the non-commercials were in an extreme positioning and to use that as a contrarian indicator. And, uh, once you have a confluence of events, namely you know, the sort of strength matrix giving us another indication and also just you know, looking at our charts and doing some good technical analysis that allows us to start to position ourselves accordingly to use the COT data to give us an insight into how we could actually look to uh, position ourselves for a good swing to position trade. So, you know, what can we learn from that? Well, you know, when the not commercials and the non-commercials are heavily positioned against each other, this is when we can expect good moves. As I said, when they're at their extremes, when we see their positioning to be at extremes, that is when we start to get interested. That is when we start to sort of expect that there might possibly be the opportunity for a reversal, okay, a, a sort of a reversal in that market, 
and that might provide us with opportunities for our own trading. Generally, the non-commercials are often wrong. Not always, as we'll see, not always. They're not often, they're often wrong when positioning is at its extremes, okay? But not always, but you know, it's a good rule of thumb, okay? It's a good rule of thumb. And this is when we start to get reversals. This is when we start to get good moves beginning, which allows smaller traders, okay, smaller private traders to join possible new trends. You saw there in that sort of a euro dollar chart, we started a nice new trend. You saw in that CAD yen that we actually had a nice trend there for about eight weeks. And that's what we're looking to do to be to see the extreme positioning of the uh, of the of the big guys okay the commercials and non-commercials to enable us to identify possible turning points which then would allow us to sort of join perhaps possible new trends so you know here's a, a bit of a, a, a sort of a different exhibit for us to take a quick look at uh, and what I'm looking at here is this is the sort of British pound futures for last year. Now, I appreciate it's not last year, last week. I do apologize. Um, now, I appreciate that, you know, some people might not particularly want to look at the short format. They might sort of struggle with understanding the uh, struggle with understanding the uh, the data. OK, and here is a uh, this is a site called copbase.com, which uh, I can recommend the, where you can get free access to their delayed uh, insight onto the COP report. Uh, and what we can see here is they have it, they're displaying it here as the British pound futures. Uh, this is from the week before last. And what we can see here is that, you know, it shows the net positioning here, okay? And it actually just shows it visually. The bright red is the commercials, the sort of bright green is the large speculators. And here we are back here down towards about 120. All right, this is where we hit a little about the start of this month, start of September. But what we can see is actually as the uh, as the sort of month has gone on, the commercials have become much much. Uh, they've sort of you know got longer positions, whereas actually the net, the uh, large speculators, okay, the non-commercials, they are actually have been heavily short, okay, they've been heavily short, and now we're at sort of extreme positioning. We're at extreme positioning, and remember what I was saying is that you know very often. Large speculators can be wrong when positions are at their extreme. And so that allows us to give us, you know, it gives us a heads up of a possible opportunity, which is from a, a trade we, we've taken a couple of weeks back. So what we actually had here is just looking at this is uh, from a couple of just a couple of weeks back where we had this is the British pound once again, British pound sterling. OK, this is from the uh, start of September. Uh, and what we'd seen was that you know, we had seen price in a, uh, you know, in a very long downtrend. OK, with lots of uh, fears over uh, Brexit and Boris over the over the summer. But what we could also see is that the non-commercials, the large speculators were short to the tune of 130,000 contracts as opposed to 38,000 contracts long. Whereas the commercials, you can see the commercials, they were positioned 207,000, right? 207,000 long contracts against 96,000 short contracts, almost sort of double the, uh, double the long side, okay? And uh, double the, yeah, their long side was almost double the size of their short, in fact, more than double their short, uh, short position. And, you know, whereas with the non-commercials, we can see are, you know, hugely, heavily, extremely positioned to the short side. <clears throat> But actually what we saw was, you know, price actually came down to the 120 area. And actually this is where it put in a double bottom with a false breakout beneath 120 before actually sort of reversing and rallying up. And then for the last couple of weeks, you know, we've actually moved at some point, we moved from about 120 to around about 125.50. So a, a kind of a, a real swing move there of about 550 pips. So, you know, for uh, most swing traders, they'd be very, very happy to sort of try and, uh, capture a piece of that particular move because we see that you know the when uh, you know when markets when when their cot report when the non-commercials are are uh, positioned to the extremes that can be very often when uh, a, a, you know a sort of a, a flip will happen in the market and we'll basically get a change of trend You know, and uh, just to add to that, to sort of help us as we were building our position, building our sort of uh, vision of what was going on. At the same time, okay, what we saw was that, you know, this was the Euro FX British pound rate, the Euro sterling rate. You know, and <clears throat> what we can see was that, you know, there's uh, the uh, kind of non-commercials, 
the non-commercials here, okay, were just slightly long, okay, they were just slightly long, to the, they, were, they had a, an edge to the long side. But what we can also see is the commercials, the commercials were actually, they were sort of almost like double the sort of size of their shorts position as opposed to the non-commercials. And what we've seen, okay, over that last, last sort of this month is a, really a reversal in the euro sterling rate. What we've seen is, you know, kind of a, a, a real pullback in that. And kind of, you can see there for yourself that just, you know, how that kind of the, uh, how the non-commercials and the commercials were positioned for that. So here's your uh, task from today's session. I always like to set you a little bit of homework, take away, work away. Your task from today's session is go away and look at your favorite trading instrument. Why not open up the COT report for that particular instrument and see what was the relationship between big moves and the particular COT positioning at that time. And try to see, you know, were there any correlations between the, uh, the moves and the positioning of the commercials and the non-commercials. That's uh, see if they, you know, if you can start to identify where there were particular correlations between their extreme positioning. Remember, that's what we're looking for, okay? To see when the uh, when the uh, big boys are at extreme positioning. So uh, to conclude, there, ladies and gentlemen, okay, the Recot report gives us insight into the moves of the major players. It's released every Friday, and you know, it's made up of commercials, non-commercials, and the small speculators in the short format version of the Cot report. Generally, don't fight the commercials, okay? Generally, don't fight the commercials. And as we said, remember when positions are extreme, very often. Very often the, the, uh, the non-commercials, the large speculators, can be quite often wrong, and that's where we may get a turn in the markets. And as you can see, when the commercials and the non-commercials flip, that is when we get changes, and that's when we start to get big moves that may occur. And as I said, it particularly suits swing and longer term trading. It's not really useful for intraday trading. It is actually something that will help you uh, understand your you know, positioning if you are someone who trades like I do. FX on a sort of longer term basis, being able to ally the COT report data with good technical analysis and good sort of strength matrix of the uh, FX markets helps you to sort of have a confluence of events, which allows you to sort of uh, build a picture from which we can start to take our trading decisions. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed that, ladies and gentlemen. But you know, of course, we appreciate you. Uh, people always want more. Uh, yeah, they always uh, want to sort of engage with us more. And now you have the opportunity to join the exclusive trading spotlight uh, community. Uh, and you can find that uh, there, okay? So you can get support after the webinar when you most need it. And you can help you discuss trading strategies, upcoming market events, signals, and more with uh, with other traders. You'll get uh, updates from Marcus, uh, myself, and Jens as we as we build that and see how uh, see how we react when uh, you know our uh, when our you know, market analysis and our trades when they match up and and when they don't. You can get uh, any recordings of any of the webinars that you've missed um, so far, and you know you can sign up for that now. Okay, just. Register at Traders Yard, then join the Trading Spotlight Group, tradersyard.com forward slash group forward slash 312. And for one month only, there's no live account required. If you're on a demo account, then you can, you're very welcome to come and join us now. So don't forget to join us uh, next time, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, as, uh, as on Wednesday, we've got Marcus here to effectively learn about how to, uh, to get your ego out of the way when trading, uh, including how your ego can affect your trading, how common mistakes that uh, traders make because their ego is egging them on, warning signs of your ego getting in the way, some top tips for ego-free trading. When is that? Well, that's at 2 p.m. this uh, Wednesday, GMT, London time, on uh, October 2nd. You can check your inbox for the uh, webinar link, and you can watch that all on uh, YouTube as well. So, and as I said, please feel free to sort of comment and, uh, you know, tell us, give us some feedback. We, uh, we always really appreciate it. So, uh, as always, you can have more analysis and education at the AdmiralMarkets.com website. If you have interest, you can contact us on hello at admiralmarkets.com or youtube.com forward slash admiralmarkets or you can facebook.com at, at forward slash admiralmarketsglobal. 
So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you found that useful. As I said, it was just an introduction to the commitment of traders reports. There are lots of uh, lots of you know great data there that you're able to sort of uh, uh, utilize and, and take on board. But today was always just about giving you a little bit of an introduction. And certainly, you, even if you are primarily an intraday trader, I would suggest go away and do the uh, homework that I talked about because I think trying to get an understanding of of how the sort of bigger traders, how they position themselves, what goes into uh, what goes into uh, uh, seeing like, like those kind of divergences of markets, seeing when the uh, the sort of commercials and non-commercials are at extreme positioning is is useful, good basic solid news, uh, solid um, solid insight for all traders to 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 understand. So I hope you found that uh, useful. What I'll do, I think we've got a, I think we've got a moment, just a moment or two, and it's the uh, we're just looking to see that uh, um, you know. What we'll do is I'll switch across to the uh, the present report. Okay, we'll just look at it very quickly for a moment or two, just so you can just see how to find it and how it's displayed, uh, and then you know have a, a take it from there. So if you just bear with me a moment, let's see if we can uh, let's see if we can do that. Uh, switch that across. Okay, so as I said, this is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission website, cftc.gov. Okay, forward slash market reports, commitment of traders index. Okay, just let's just draw that on so people can uh, people can always uh, uh, see that well. Okay, so we can uh, go. Okay, you can see the uh, there is the link in there, but if you wish to have the the website, there you go. You can find it there as well. And um, and you know what we're looking for here, as I said, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Okay, short format is 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 enough for us at the uh, at this particular moment uh, and you can see it's actually it's displayed like this okay it's nothing um it's, it's nothing terribly fancy about it but you can see lots of uh, commodities there so you can see there's there's butter there's milk okay non-fat dry milk okay there's uh lean hogs there's lots there but of course you know we're just mostly particularly interested in let's say fx markets you can see here russian ruble show the positioning Canadian dollar there, okay. Canadian dollar there, we can see there, okay. You can see what the latest, the latest uh, um, data is, and the kind of the interesting thing is, you know, is also just looking at what were the changes from the previous week, okay. There's clearly a sort of a big change going on there in Canadian dollars. Big changes there. That's the sort of thing to sort of make a note of. Sort of add that to your particular uh, uh, to your sort of trading watch list to see is that an indication that we might see be seeing a little bit of a. Uh, We've seen a bit of extreme positioning and we're looking to sort of, uh, um, there might be a change with that. But as I said, you can see the Swiss franc, the Mexican pesos there, British pound, uh, British pound sterling there, okay. You know, of course, there's lots of people very interested in that due to lots of uh, volatility there. And we can still see that, you know, even now, okay, we are still primarily short, okay. Non-commercials are still primarily short that the uh, British pound by you know 105 you know they're sort of four times more short than they are uh, than they are long whereas the commercials the commercials are 183,000 contracts long as opposed to 84,000 contracts short so the commercials are long okay the non commercials are very very heavily short still so that uh, gives us some indication to to look at so there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, we sort of run out of time uh, there today, but thank you for joining as always. Okay, I hope you found this particularly useful. And as I said, sometimes it can be a little bit intimidating, you know, to begin with, but take your time and look through it and you'll enjoy it and the, it'll, you'll find it, uh, the information uh, useful. So best of uh, luck in your own trading and I look forward to speaking to you soon. Many thanks.